So tonight we're looking at a passage out of Isaiah. Isaiah is a book in the Old Testament named after a prophet. And the way that the system worked with God's people in the Old Testament is God would call a prophet, God would speak to this prophet, and then the prophet would speak to the people, um, whatever it is that God said. So the book of Isaiah is many chapters long, I can't, 60 something, I can't remember how many. Um, and the first two thirds of it is judgment, basically. It's a lot of not so great things, pointing out what um, the Israelites have done, places they've wandered, things they shouldn't be doing, but they're doing anyways, bowing down to idols, um, anything that the world has pulled them into is what they're doing. So that's what Isaiah is telling them in the first two thirds of this book. It's basically a laundry list. Imagine your mother calling you and saying, I heard you did this and this and this and this and going on for two hours. That's what this is like for, um, for the first two thirds of the book. What's so great is the second, or this is the second third, oh my goodness, the third third of the book. I've been out of college a while, you know, it's just it happens. Um, the third third of the book is about the hope, the restoration, the promise. Um, we're ending on the, the good note, as, as it may be. So starting in chapter 43, we're going to start right at verse 1. Um, I'm reading out of the NRSV, which might be a little different, but it's the same idea, of course. So here's what it says. Um, yeah, chapter 43. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Hear the words of the Lord. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you, I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So let's talk about the, the context a little bit of this passage first to give us an idea. Um, like we said, this is a word from God, uh, spoken to Isaiah, for God's people. It's meant to be a word of encouragement, of hope, kind of coming back from all the, the judgment pieces. Um, look real quick back at, um, well, even verse 1, for example. So, but, uh, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, uh, he who formed you, O Israel. Just um, so you're aware of what that means. This is God's people. These are two names for God's people. So I want you to hear yourself, because as the church, we are a part of God's people as well. So I want you to hear yourself in this passage. God is speaking to you as well. Um, down further in, let's see, verse 3 and 4, when he's talking about giving people and nations in exchange for the people of Israel, he mentions Egypt and Ethiopia and Seba. The people of Israel were a small group. They uh, were not powerful. They um, didn't really have any power except for that they were the people of God. And the, pe the nations that are listed in this passage are people of power. They are nations of military power. They have excellent um, you know, spread of land. They've got all the, all the good stuff in these nations. And God says, I will give those nations for you, my people. So that just gives us a little bit um, of context. And also, if you look back at, which we, we won't do fully, but if you look back at Isaiah 42, just one chapter ago, um, it, it helps us see the judgment section. In uh, the very end of 42 especially, you hear all about the ways that the people of Israel have gone astray. Things that they've done, um, they've been captivated by the world. And because they have followed those temptations and those addictions that the world has presented to them, God has literally allowed them to be taken into captivity. People literally came into their land, took them captive, and took them back to their homeland. So in that captivity or in exile uh, from their homeland, the Israelites would have been prisoners. 
They would have walked through fire, through really difficult times. They would have the feeling of being completely overwhelmed, as if by a raging river, like it says in the passage. So think about here what God is doing in this passage. What he says is even in those times, when you walk through the fire, when you go through the rivers, when the water is raging, and you are sure you'll not survive. Think about if you were going through fire, literally. A fire alarm actually just was tripped next door. Many of you didn't see it because you were worshiping, but I saw it through the window. Um, think about if that, bird, that building was actually on fire. I'm thankful it wasn't. Um, but you would feel pretty helpless, potentially. Um, so think, what about a time that you felt like you are not going to make it through? It may not be a physical situation like the building is on fire, but it might be something as simple as, I'm sure I am not going to finish this paper on time. I am sure you've all been there. If you haven't, you are not true college students. Um, what, about, yeah. um, what about if, oh, I really messed up this time. There is no way that this friend or my parents or whoever is going to forgive me. Um, or those moments that we feel so low that we are sure, oh, I can't believe I did that again. I promised God I would never do that again. And here I am doing it again. I'm sure God will never take me back. But what God says is, even in those times where you are sure you won't survive, God says, I am with you because you are mine. God says, I am with you because I have called you by name. Think back to elementary or middle school, whichever was worse for you. Mine was middle school. Um, wouldn't go back there for anything. Um, how many of you, if you don't mind raising your hands, please do, how many of you ever had a run-in with some sort of bully? Somebody who just said mean things or did mean things, great. Okay, I'm sorry that happened. I'm glad you survived. <laughs> Bullies make us stronger is what they say, but I think they're just mean. Um, so one way that bullies operate is by finding something that might be a little bit true about you. Sometimes it's not true at all, but that might be a little bit true, and they use that thing to torment you. Um, they often give you a label. It might be in something in your appearance. Glasses are always a big one for kids. They, you know, go the four eyes route. It's so unoriginal. But they, you know, they might use something like that. They might use um, your, I was always the tallest kid in my class, and apparently girls aren't supposed to be tall or something. So there was something about that that I was always nicknamed with. Um, it might be your family. You uh, might be your brothers and sisters. It could be anything. But they find this thing, and they give you a new name. They torment you with, with, that, um, with that label. And I'm assuming, even if you can't think of some nickname that you were given that, didn't, that you couldn't leave behind until you left high school, um, you probably can think of that one kid in your class that was always given the most unfortunate nickname. Um, so when a bully hands out, and, and I guess it doesn't have to be a bully per se, but when you are given a nickname, something that is continually said to you, something that people continually call you, especially over years and years, that person gain some sort of level of ownership over you. And that may be kind of a weird way to think about it, but now they're somewhat responsible for how you experience your day. If you go to school and you've got this kid who just won't leave you alone, who's always saying mean things to you, they have a lot of power over how your day goes. They can decide if you have an okay day, if you survive, if you make it through, or if you go home in tears, or go to the nurse's office and call your mom to come pick you up early, right? That person has that kind of power on you. And this is the power that the world likes to have on us. The world likes to give us labels, um, and once we hear those labels enough, we begin to embody them. And it isn't a point of weakness, it's not some flaw that you have that, oh, I just, you know, this, this name this person gave me kept, you know, bringing me down. It, it's nothing like that. It's just as humans, that's how we react. We become who we are told that we are. And this is why names are so important. One summer I was um, a, kind of like a camp counselor for a leadership camp. So I had my little group of five or six high school students. And for the two weeks we were together, we were teaching them about leadership, how to be an effective leader, how to plan things, all kinds of things that have to do with leadership. So I get to know these kids pretty well. And at the end of the two weeks, as kind of a parting gift to them, each of the group leaders gets to write a letter. And in this letter, we're telling them what leadership skills we see in them. And it's an encouragement thing, trying to you know, say, hey, we think you're gonna be a great leader, here's why, whatever. So as our facilitator was teaching us about this, 
This is what she said. When you write these letters, don't just say, hey, Zach, I think that you are going to be a great leader because I saw public speaking skills in you this week. That doesn't really, doesn't really say much. But what she said is speak prophetically instead. Pretend like you're a prophet like Isaiah. She said, tell them about the potential that you see in them because names are important and we tend to live into who we think we are. So I had one kid who, um, he was kind of all over the place. He was the kid who was always, who would be called too loud or he would be called obnoxious or whatever. Um, so I tried to think of, of ways to express to him the potential that I saw in him. And I honestly cannot remember exactly what I told him, but after he read his letter, he was supposed to be heading home and he came back and he said, nobody's ever said that about me before. Nobody's ever said I could be a, a good person to talk to or somebody who listens well. I think that's what it was. I told him that he listens well. Nobody ever, nobody ever said that before. So that's the kind of impact that words or names can have. So what God tells us in this passage in Isaiah is that no matter who the world says we are, God has given us a new name. There will be people throughout your life, and many of them good-intentioned, um, well, well-intentioned people who will label you in some way that is not consistent with the name that God has given you. Um, there are lots of ways that people or situations will try to disqualify you from what God has called you to do. You might be told you're not smart enough. You might be told you're too lazy or you're too shy or you're too smart, you're overqualified, you're, I mean, you know, the list can go on and on, right? You might be disqualified because of your income level. You might be disqualified because of your family background or your age or your gender or the way you look. But the name that God gives you is the only one that has merit. God's name for you is the only one that should have power in your life. Um, to share just a, a little bit of my story, growing up I was taught sometimes outright, some, you know, somebody said this directly to me, and sometimes just from what I observed and saw. But I was taught that it wasn't okay for girls or for women to be too loud. I was always told to be quiet. I was always told that, oh, you can't talk right now, or, oh, you know, shh, whatever, whatever way it came out, that it wasn't okay um, to be strong or to be, um, to, to speak in some ways. And as I grew, I internalized that in different ways. And you might be able to think of your own things that you were taught as, as you were growing up and that you started to internalize those things. And I always felt like I had to apologize for who I was because I was loud and I was, I'm sure, very obnoxious and um, assertive and, and all of that, and maybe I still am. Um, but I always felt like I had to apologize or learn coping mechanisms to hide my true self. But thankfully, God has brought me on this journey that God continues to remind me that the only name that matters in my life is the one that God gave me. The, the labels of too much or too loud or too silly or too different or too whatever, they don't hold any power unless I give them power. God wants us to take the name that God has given us and leave behind the names that the world has given us. The beautiful thing about the names that God gives us is that it can't be taken away. Nobody can take that from you. You can mess up all you want, and you can even try to mess up, and God still calls you beloved. God still calls you my daughter. God still calls you my son. One of my favorite Proverbs is uh, Proverbs 24, 16, and it says, For though a righteous person falls seven times, she rises again but the wicked are brought down by calamity. Now, if you're thinking, well, I've messed up more than seven times, so this can't be talking about me. Remember that Proverbs are poetry, so it's not literally talking about seven times. It just means a lot. So this righteous person has fallen a lot. They have messed up all over the place. But notice, this righteous person is no more righteous. They still have that label of a righteous person, of called by God even though she's fallen a lot of times. So you may hear this differently. It may hit you differently. But what I get from this passage is that it must mean that our actions and our mistakes do not define us. They don't tell us who we are, and they don't have the right to label us. In our passage from Isaiah, we have this promise from God. 
God is giving a promise to protect us and to restore us. He promises to gather us in from all the places. He talks about every side of the earth, the east, the west, the north, the south. He promises to walk with us through the difficult moments. And, my favorite, God promises to name us. God promises to give us that. And similar to the bully, God names us and therefore holds some power, right? God gets some ownership over us when God names us. However, unlike the bully, God names us and takes ownership of us so that God can walk with us. Not so that God can point out all the things we did wrong, not so that God can keep that laundry list, but so that God can walk with us through the storms of life. This passage is often used uh, when churches talk about Jesus' baptism, or any baptism, really, because it's a story of salvation in Isaiah. It's... um, it tells us that there's nothing that we can do to receive salvation, right? They've messed up 42 chapters of messing up from the people of Israel. And all they have to do is accept the call from God. We're offered a new name in spite of our choices, and God invites us to take off the baggage and all the names that the world gives us and put on a name that is light. When Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, take off the heavy burden of what the world expects from you, of what the world says you should be. Take that off and leave it behind. Here, I've got a light one, something that fits who you are and who I created you to be. When we accept God's call, we are then called daughters and sons of the king. So even when, even with a new name, God gives you this new name, you are my son, you are my daughter, the world will still try to reclaim us. People will still give us names and labels and tell us what they expect from us and who we're supposed to be. And these things don't line up with who God says we are. But when we fully lean into that name that God has given us, Um, it's just the other names don't hold any power. Occasionally, we might even give ourselves names. We mess up so many times that we start talking down to ourselves and saying, oh, I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to get this right. The name I gave myself over years and years is that I'm a screw-up. That was my name for myself. If I can't get anything right, I always mess up, and I try really, really hard. I think... You know, I'm going through all the things that I'm supposed to do, and somehow I'm still not measuring up. I'm still disappointing people around me and disappointing myself. But when God started really working on this in me, teaching me the names that God has for me, that voice in the back of my head got softer and softer, and God's names for me got louder and louder. I didn't have to be defined anymore by the things or the people that I encounter here, My only definition comes from my Savior. My only definition comes from the Holy One of Israel, the Lord our God. So when you came in tonight, um, you may have written a word or a phrase on on a mirror. And these were names that you've been given that um, people have have claimed you or that you've given to yourself even. Um, These are things that have defined you. And this is a very, Nate, would you grab that for me? Um, This is a very basic illustration. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with it. Um, But when we have these names that cloud our vision, we can't see the true picture of who it is that God has made us to be. When we have these names that cloud, thank you, Vanna. When we have all of these names, you can't see the true reflection of yourself. You may see parts of yourself, right? You see a part of yourself in the mirror, but it's crossed over by lines of these terrible things that the world has told us. And admittedly, the names the world gives you, they may not always be mean, negative things, but they're expectations that you have to be this because of whatever. And that is not what God has called us to be. God has said, I have created you for a purpose, and God is the only one that gets to define us. So we're going to have, um, I'll put this here, I guess. Um, yeah. I did it again. Don't go on the speaker. Um, we're going to have the worship team uh, come up, and they're going to play a song of invitation for us. 
and you are always welcome, of course, to sing. Please don't feel like you need to. Um, this is more a space of prayer and reflection for you. Um, I'm actually going to move that over to our prayer table. And I want to invite you, if you are ready, to put aside the name. Oh, yeah, you can have this. Um, to put aside the name that the world has given you. Don't let them have power over you anymore. And take the name that God has given you. Come up if you are ready to do that. Um, it'll be sitting over there. Take a swipe at the mirror and cross off some of those names. Please don't wipe the whole thing away because there are lots of people in the room. So leave space for everybody. But next to the mirror, there are two containers with name tags in them. And this name tag has names that God has given you. Now these are names for every child of God, and God may very well give you more specific individuals. Starter to say, I'm going to be what God calls me to be. If you don't want to come up and do the mirror, we'll have one of these back there on your way out so you can still take a name tag. I want to challenge you to keep this someplace that is visible. So it's not just that you know you are these things, but that the world knows I am beloved. I am hidden in Christ. I am forgiven. I'm redeemed. I'm worthy. Stick it on your backpack or on your gym bag or on your shoes. I don't know. Someplace it's got the little clip on it. Um, Some place that you can declare that this is who I'm going to say I am. Um, we're going to let them play and then, uh, then we'll finish up. We're going to do the prayer team up in the back and uh, the prayer table up here as well. So if there's something you need to talk about with somebody or grab a friend next to you if you are most comfortable with that, that's fine. But I want you to look at these words one more time. This is one of my favorite songs, I have to admit, but these, uh, these words say all. Oh, this is who you are in God. You are forgiven, you are beloved, you are hidden in Christ. You are righteous, and you are holy. God has redeemed you from all of your wanderings, from any place you would find yourself. God says, I will bring you back to me. Um, can you pray with me real quick? And